he probably knows all about it already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Well, we start here. Thomas Edison was born in 1847 in a little town called Milan, Ohio. When he was about seven years old, the family, this is his mother and his father, when he was moved to, they were moved to uh, Port Huron, Michigan. Port Huron, Michigan. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and he was about seven years old, and that's where he went to school, the one and only time in his life, for just 90 days. And the teacher couldn't put up with him asking so many questions, and so yeah. he called his, uh, called his mother and said, take this kid out of here, there's something wrong with him. He asked too many questions. Asked. <laughs> So she was a school teacher herself, retired, took him home, and she began to homeschool. Homeschool him. Yeah. And before you know it, he started to do his reading and writing. He was learning very well. But these books, uh, Natural and Experimental Philosophy, Quantitative Chemical Analysis, mm. he was reading these by 10 years old. <laughs> oh, yeah. he's I mean, a smart guy. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't read these until I was 11. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little smarter than you. Yeah, he was yeah, smart. He was fast. <laughs> Well, anyway, this book told all about the latest of technology of the time, which happened to be the telegraph. The telegraph. And the telegraph was inv invented just 10 years before he was born, 1837. 1837. By Samuel F. B. Morse. And uh, this book told the quantitative chemical analysis, told him how to make a battery. So between the battery and this book with the telegraph, he was able to make his own unit. And he made one for his friend, and together they strung a wire between their houses. And they start sending messages at night between them, like the kids do today with the text, early uh -huh. textures. That early textures, right? Yeah. Has it always been called Morse code? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's always, always been, been called Morse. Oh yeah, because it was invented by uh, Samuel F. B. Morse. Right. Morse. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it, the Morse code is made up of what we call dots and dashes. Dashes, right? And a dot, a dot sounds like this, and a dash is longer. So most people know S O S. That that that. Dash, 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 that, da, da, that. da. That sounds like this. Right. Okay, you can hear the rhythm of that. Mm -hmm. What's the first letter of your name? First letter? F. Da, 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 da. Uh, there. What's mm -hmm. the first letter of your name? Dot. E? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. But I know, like, um, in in the movie, uh, what's this? Longest Day. Remember that first thing? Do, 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 do. Did it it on that one? Dun, dun, oh, that's, dun, dun. Yeah. that's victory. Yeah, victory. Deep for victory. Did yeah. it on. Yeah, that's why in that movie you start with that. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Ah. Yeah. 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 It was my it, that was my friend who told me like, ah. don't you know that that's the, the <laughs> thing and yeah. That's what that means. Yeah. That's why you always hear that. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, good. that's also Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, right? Oh, right. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so he learned this very well, and he loved this book, this chemistry book. And in fact, he started to buy chemicals with his uh, allowance money. Uh -huh. And he set up a little laboratory in his basement, and he was make, mixing chemicals. He and learning, it, right? And he, he, he started a fire. His mother smelled some odor from the basement, mm -hmm. and so she said, you're going to burn my house down. So she took him out of the basement, moved him into the barn, Right. which two years later he burned down. He burned down. The barn. Mm -hmm. So that was a good move, getting him out of the house, right? Right. Well, when he turned 11 years old, he said to his mother, I think I know enough. What do you mean enough? You're only 11 years old. He said, I want to get a job on that new railroad that goes between yeah, he went to Port Huron to uh, Detroit. It was called the Grand Trunk Railway. Yeah, the GT. Okay. The they call it the GT now. GT? Yeah. GT? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. GT. How, how could you be familiar with that from that? Because yes. I'm trying to trace the Philippine national heroes of Rob from San Francisco to Chicago, and then what did he take? He took the Grand Trunk, Very because good. the Grand Trunk goes all the way from Michigan, I mean like, instead of Detroit, goes to Sarnia, to Niagara Falls. Yeah. From Niagara Falls you go down good. to New York. Very yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's why I said like, what is GT? Like, and I saw, Trump. Very good. Mm, uh -huh. So anyway, so he got a job on that, and his job was to sell newspapers and candy to the travelers. Mm -hmm. So he would walk up and down the rows and selling his newspapers. He was doing, doing okay for a kid, you know. Until one day he realized, you know, they'd go on the train, would go all through these fields and farmers' fields. And uh, this was during the American uh, Revolution, the American uh, Civil War. Yeah, 1862. Two, three, four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. five is it's already done. Yeah. Two, three, four. So, uh, he, he, they would go through these farms, and uh, he would realize that the 
farmers would be selling their fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So he would step off the train and he realized this would be a good source. He buys the fruits and vegetables and starts selling that on the train along with the newspapers. Mm -hmm. Boy, you know what, he was making more money with the fruits and vegetables than he was with the, uh, with the newspapers alone. Right. Before you know that, he started a little business. He hired two other boys to mm -hmm. do the same thing. His uh, first entrepreneurial right. position. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he did that and um, one day he asked the conductor, he says, could I have a little table like this in the baggage car? Mm -hmm. He says, sure, but for what? He says, well, he says, uh, you know, uh, first of all, he says, uh, I, I, I talked to these people outside during the American the Civil War, and he says, and they give me all kinds of information about what's going on and all that. And he says, I would like to write a newspaper and uh, produce it and sell it. And he says, okay, so he gave him the desk. And he bought himself a little used printing press, and then he put out this little newspaper, the Herald. The Herald. Mm. Ah, that's the Herald. Oh, that's the actual size of it. Yeah, that's it. Just a, wow. Okay. He did it himself. Yeah, and here's a picture of him setting the type on the yeah. train and all that. Right. He yeah. was doing it. Yeah. And so, the following year, he asked the conductor. He says, "Could I have another table like this?" He says, "Now what?" He says, "He says, well, he says." Uh, you know, when we get up to Detroit, there's a three-hour layover before we come back. He says, and I'd like to be able to mix chemicals from my book over here. He says, mm -hmm. I hate to waste that time. So he says, sure, all right. So he gave him the desk. So he would mix his chemicals and he's doing his thing. And one day they must have hit some bad track and vibrated the, uh, the, the train vibrated. And he had a jar of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he rolled off and hits the floor of the train and up in flames. The train. The, yeah. the train, right. Uh -huh. Luckily, the uh, conductor was there with a bucket of water, and he quickly put it out. Uh -huh. but boy, was he mad. A young Tom almost burning down his train. train. So when the next stop came, the doors opened, he grabbed Tom by the two ears, and he threw him off the train. He, and, uh, and that's when he said he felt a pop in both ears. Uh -huh. And he right, lost his right after that, he started to lose his hearing. Uh -huh. When he died, he had no hearing in this ear, and he was down to about 30% in this ear. So he had some hearing. But we don't know how, stu how true this whole story is about that pop and all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. he, told, uh -huh. he told it many, many times, and each time there was a little variation to it. And also his, his parents both had hearing problems. Oh, so, yeah. you know, there's, there's things, be. there's other, kind mm -hmm. of other factors. Anyway, uh, the, he was so mad at him, he threw him off the train, and he took all his printing press, and he took all his uh, chemical, and threw that off the train, and that was it. He was out of a job. Mm -hmm. Well, the next part of the story is young Tom was sitting at a train station and he was sitting there and all of a sudden he looks down and there's a boy playing on the track. And the boy, the little boy didn't realize that a train had broken loose and was rolling towards him. Mm -hmm. And you see the brakeman up on the top trying to stop the train. The train. But anyway, young Tom runs out there and grabs the little boy, saves his life. And just then the father of the boy came on and saw what he had done. He said, you just saved my son's life. He said, I want to give you a reward. He said, no, no, I don't want a reward. But he was all in uniform. He says, but you're the, you're the train master, right? He says, yes. Mm -hmm. He says, could you teach me how to be a telegraph operator? He says, I know the Morse code. I've been doing that for years, but I'd like to do this professionally. Mm -hmm. He says, sure, you saved my son's life. I'd be glad, glad to do that. So. The, this man, Mr. McKenzie, he invited young Tom to come live with him for one year because he was only 14 years old by that time. And he brought him to work every day and showed him the proper operation, how to become a real uh, professional. So when he turned 15 years old, he became, he worked, he got a job with Western Union and as mm -hmm. a temporary uh, telegrapher. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Telegrapher, yeah. And so as a temporary, he would go here, then he'd move him here, and wherever they needed somebody to fill in, mm -hmm. that was his job. They called it itinerant telegrapher, that's what it was called. So he did that for about six years, jumping around, learning all, about all different kinds of telegraph systems and all that. He uh, really a learning process. When he turned 21 years old, he wound up in Boston, Massachusetts. And in Boston, Massachusetts, he made the conscious decision that he no longer wanted to be just a telegraph operator. He now wanted to be a full-time inventor. Inventor. Mm -hmm. So he invents this machine, which was called the vote recorder. And it was meant for the Massachusetts legislature, so that when they voted on a bill, mm -hmm. all they had to do was push one of the two buttons on their desk, a yay or a nay, yes mm -hmm. or a no. Very simple. Mm -hmm. Well, he installed the buttons at all the, all the senators' desks, but they used it, and the first at the end of the first day, 
It came out of, the, of a closed door meeting. They said, we didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Why not? Did it work? Oh, yeah, it worked, but we didn't like it. But, but why didn't you like it? He says, it was too fast. How could anything be too fast? Mm -hmm. He says, well, you see, this is not the way we do business. Mm -hmm. You see, once you push that button, that's it. You recorded your yeah, vote. Right. We don't if do you it change that. your mind. Yeah, we come up here at the last second and try to get you to change your vote. You already voted. See, it's too fast. Uh, okay, so he made it. He figured it out. He says, I will never again invent something that people don't need or want. So it was a very good lesson for him uh, oh. in his first invention. So with that, he jumps on a steamboat and comes down to New York City where he had a friend of his who was a... Uh, who was working at the gold exchange on Wall Street. And he went down there and he walks in and the men were trading gold and buying and selling and you know, it was exciting. 21 year old kid, really exciting. And then all of a sudden, the men started to scream and the guy said, he asked the guy next to him, what's going on? He says, oh, that machine probably broke again. Oh, machine, huh? He loved machines, so he worked through the crowd and he spots the machine. It was a little device with a glass top. It was like a gumball cup. He took the cover off that, and he's looking, and he's looking. He saw the problem right away. A little spring jumped off. He put the spring back on where it belonged, and the machine started to work. And he puts the cover on, and he turns around, and who's behind him but the boss? The boss said, I saw what you did. You, you know how to fix these? He says, yes, sir. He says, I want to offer you a job. $350 a month to That's maintain that machine. big money. Oh, that was big money. But he says, um, a very important job to maintain it. He says, okay, I'll take it. So he did that for a while, and he was working in New York. And uh, but he wasn't the kind of guy at the end of the day, nine to five, to go home and sit around and read the sports page, you know. So he would come home and instead of doing that, he came across from New York to New Jersey, and he opened up a factory up in Newark, right by the train station in Newark. And it was there that he had he had all these people working for him. Wow! And they were making things mainly for the telegraph industry. Other things, fire alarms and stuff like that, but mainly for the telegraph industry. Sort of, sort of subcontracting, huh? Subcontracting, I don't know about that, but he was selling the, the, the parts and pieces. I see, oh, yeah. a vendor. So, um, okay. He was creating that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so he was, uh, he was doing very well. He was, he was making money. Uh, he invents this thing here, which was called the, um, the quadruplex. What that did was, uh, Western Union was a you know fledgling company at the time, and uh, they really couldn't expand much more because they were using the, the telegraph wires that were on along the tracks for the trains, and the train the, the trains need that they need that telegraph wire too, so they could only send messages in between railroad transmissions. Mm -hmm. So he came up with an idea how to multiplex or uh, make four transmissions on one wire. Mm -hmm. He called it the quadruplex. quadruplex. And so that revolutionized everything. So now the railroad could use their own wire, and they had three additional wires they could use, rent out or whatever, for other things. For other things. Mm -hmm. And so Western Union, who was the biggest uh, player at the time, started to buy up everything and anything they could get, and they, he was making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. He was doing very, very well, the mm -hmm. quadruplex. And it was there in this location up in Newark Mm -hmm. that he has, he meets this little girl who was uh, working for him. He had a fancy for her, mm -hmm. and he proposes to her, and get, they get married. How? She was six, 16 years She was 16, but he was in his 20s, yeah, 20, right? I think, 20, 20 21. 21, yeah. yeah. And, and her, she was younger. Yeah. And they had three children. This was Marion. This is Thomas Alva Edison, Jr. Jr. And this was William Leslie. The first two were born up in Newark, William Leslie was born here in Menlo Park. Now, where does Menlo Park come from? He was getting tired of Newark and the noisy, dirty city, and he asked around. He says, anybody here know where we could move to? He said, I'd like to get out of the city. And somebody who lived in the next town of Metuchen said, I know a place you might be interested in. It's called Menlo Park. Oh, really? He says, what's that? Well, he says, it's a failed housing development. They planned on building houses, but they couldn't sell them because of the downturn in the economy. Mm -hmm. And he says, and it's right on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Did you see the railroad down below? Yeah, it's right on the Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Railroad. Oh, when he heard railroad, oh, he spent half his life on the railroad. He says, oh, I'm interested. So he comes down here, and he gets off the train down below, and he walks up this hill. This is called Christie Street. Mm -hmm. And 
outside where you see that piece of land with the tower on it. He said, that's the spot I want to build my laboratory. So outside where that tower is now, mm. that is the spot that's that he built spot. his laboratory. So here's the laboratory that was built right there. Okay? Mm. This little white building, that's the building we happen to be in right now. Mm. But you notice that building is right on top of what used to be the machine shop. So the mm. machine shop was right here. Mm -hmm. And that's where they were able to fabricate any parts or pieces that he needed. So which one is Christie Street? This is Christie Street. This is Christie Street. Street. Yeah. Yeah. So from where we're at here, this building, if you look directly mm -hmm. across the street, you see there's a billboard. Mm -hmm. And that billboard signifies where Edison started his experimental electric train mm -hmm. from. Okay? And I'll tell you about that in the mm -hmm. back. Um, this is his office. All these buildings are gone, but this building and this building were made of bricks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell you in a minute, but this building here was a little shed out in the backyard at, that they used, he, he used to make carbon. Mm -hmm. And he had these kerosene lamps in it. And he purposely turned the wicks up real high that in the glass chimney they'd get all black with soot. Well, he knew that that soot was pure carbon. So he'd send somebody out there every day to scrape that carbon out and bring it into the laboratory, and he used that carbon in his experiments. Very important little shed. Uh, as you can see, there, is, there are no buildings left here. Well, it's well over a hundred years, but um, mm -hmm. Edison was only here for about six and a half years until his young wife passes away. And she passed away, um, she passed away because she had these terrible headaches. They didn't know what to do for her, so they didn't even have aspirin yet, but they, they might have been migraine headaches. Could be. Could be. Mm -hmm. But they gave her morphine as, to kill the pain. And, yeah. That's that's what happened. And mm -hmm. she passed. She overdosed on that. So anyway, so he comes up here and he spots this piece of land out here and he says, "This is the spot I want to build my laboratory." So he walks down the hill and on the left hand side was this building, this house, all the way down on the corner. Mm -hmm. And he goes in there and that was the corporate headquarters for the Menlo Park Association. And so he goes in there and he says. I'd like to buy this land that I hear is for sale. And he says, yeah, he says, but the house comes with it. Oh, okay. So by this time he was doing well, he had, he had a lot of money, and he bought the land and the house for $5,200. Not bad, right? Mm -hmm. But in those days, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of money. big money. Sure. But, but he did very well with that. Mm -hmm. So he... Uh, he, he Can you imagine how many blocks is that? That's you oh, yeah, yeah. Pacific it's 36, 36 acres. 36 and acres. it had already been all cleared. There were no trees. All the roads were already in, like that. Oh, all the roads are in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and already all, subdivided. All already named and everything. And, yeah. Just mm -hmm. what, and, um, and Where's yeah. the house located? Somewhere uh, by Pennsylvania? Yeah, right? have to, I'd have to get my glasses uh -huh. to show you. I will, I'll show you after, but I'll have to okay. get my glasses on. Um, anyway, so, so that's, they planned on building a home on each one of those little squares, like a lot. And, mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, so uh, um, so he so he, he buys the property. This is the house. That house was down our corner, just to the left. It's gone. It, it burned down in 1917. And uh, it, and William Leslie was born there just a few months later. Okay. And so he finally moves into his new building, and um, he starts to work. And uh, uh, great things came out of it, which I'll tell you all about as we go in the back. Okay, so after his wife died, he packed up his children because now he was a bachelor and he had no need, you know, he was a workaholic. So he wanted to work. And so he brought his children to New York City where he was already at this point uh, working on the uh, lighting system downtown in Manhattan. In Manhattan, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he goes, he, he takes the children to New York and, um, uh, and did not come back here until 1925. Many, many, many years. Many years. Yeah. And he only came back, and here he was a, as an old man, he came mm -hmm. back because they put up this, he, they commissioned this monument, which is right down our street, uh, Christie Street, just to the left. And it's, you can it's, 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 it's on it's there. It's there, and it's on Route 27, so it's only two blocks down. But if you were to see that, right back here is where the house was. Mm -hmm. Okay, right behind, that would have been on the front, the front lawn, actually. Okay, 
Okay, so, so so when he went back to New York, when he went to New York City, what became of the properties here? Well, that's what happened. He uh, once day he lost his wife. Uh, within two years, he was remarried, mm -hmm. and right. the neighbors knew he wasn't going to come back because they read it in the newspaper. He bought a piece of property up in West Orange, bought a new, start building a laboratory up there, and they knew he wasn't coming back. So essentially, the operations here oh, shut that, down. Oh, it totally stopped. Yeah. Okay. So a little at a time. The, the locals occupied the buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, this built the main building here. Uh, they they moved their animals into the ground floor and they oh, it's like, just a barn, like a barn or like something. A barn. Right. The top floor was a single a single floor. Single floor. They made a, don a dance hall out of it and mm -hmm. you know and used it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a little at a time, as it got cold, they would rip the boards off the uh, building and throw it into the fireplace to keep warm. Before you know it, they burned everything down. And burned everything. I down. mentioned this was brick and this was brick because. What happened to the brick buildings? Well, the neighbors blew up the buildings to use the bricks, to reuse the bricks. Mm -hmm. They made chimneys and stairs and fireplaces. Mm -hmm. They knew he wasn't coming back. Right. So they utilized it, you know, repurposed it. Did he didn't get the money out of it or no, something? No, no. It was donated back to the state oh, later on. Back to the state. Yeah. So that's basically it. But so 19, 1925 is when he came back here the first time, the last time that we know of him. Mm -hmm. And four years later, happened to be the anniversary, the, f the 50th anniversary of the light bulb. Mm -hmm. And so they made a, uh, Henry Ford made a big uh, uh, museum mm -hmm. out in uh, Deerfield, Deer Dearborn, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And Thomas Edison was out there with his friend Henry Ford on this 50th anniversary. And what they did is Henry Ford recreated this village out there as the, the center point of his um, a museum. Okay. So it's exactly as you see this. That one was out really there cool. in Michigan. I see. Oh, in Michigan. Right. What the part of Michigan? Is Dearborn, Dearborn, Michigan, Dearborn. right outside of, of uh, Detroit. Okay. Yeah, because um, the Ford Company. Yeah, of course, that's there. where nearest headquarters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Ford expanded it, and you know, it's a beautiful place to go. Oh, mm -hmm. it's, it's wonderful. You see that, but there's a thousand other things. You see the Wright Brothers uh, factory. Uh, oh yeah. You see Marvel. Uh, Mm -hmm. Orville, you know, and you can see where they the, the bicycle mm -hmm. factory where they you know where they, the, the store where they sold the, the tires and all that. Yeah, the tires. Yeah, you know, it's great to see. It's a great place to go. Anyway, so if, uh, so this was 50 years after he invented the light bulb here, and on that day it was such a big occasion that uh, the president of the United States was there upstairs waiting for him for Edison. 1929. 1929. Who was the president then? Uh, I don't know. Hayes? 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 Oh, 79. Eight, no, no, no. no eight, 20, 1929. Oh, 1929, that's Hoover. Hoover. That's Hoover? Yeah. The, during the, that's already the part of the Depression, isn't it? Yeah, well, it depends when in 29. 29 is the early part. October 29. The Depression was October. October. Well, oh. this is October 21st, that was the So, other. it was right by it. Yeah, right by it. Yeah. When was, when was uh, Black Friday? It's like October 25th, 9th or something well, like that. Well, four days, five, five days, days, five days, five days later. <laughs> yeah, five yeah. days later. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, five yeah. days later. All broke loose, right? Right. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, so... A lot of people hang themselves, right? Oh, yeah. They like, jumped out of windows. Jumped their windows. They're like, ooh, depression. Yeah. Mm. So, anyway, so this was 1929. And here at Menlo Park, um, there was a tower erected on that same spot mm -hmm. over here right there by the Edison pioneers this was a group of ex-employees and uh, people that loved Edison and they pooled money and they built this tower on the same on the same spot where you see this tower and on the top there was a light bulb and Edison out in Michigan pushed a button and mm. lit the light on top of this he was in Michigan and lit it up here can you imagine doing that no, back right, then? That is high tech <laughs> in those days. <laughs> Today you could do that with easy, easy <laughs> with the internet, but without an internet. I control my cell phone yeah, with my Anywhere cell. in the world, right? <laughs> I control my uh, camera with my cell phone. That's right. Yeah. So that was a big deal. So he turned that on. That's a big invention. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was 1929, and he died just two years later at age 84. In 1931. But that's long life. Oh, that was days. a long life, a very fruitful yeah. life. Right. Very. Because you have people die at what, 50? Oh, 20s, 30s. 30s, 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 30s yeah. His wife died, she was 20 something. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, um, so that, that was basically the story of, of, uh, of the tower. But that tower came down a few years later in a storm. And 
then they rebuilt the tower that you see there now in 1938 and made this one out of concrete so it's... it's uh, so this um, is originally a 1938? Yes, yeah. that, that is the tower from 1938. It, uh -huh. just, it just finished a, a, a major renovation and it was reopened last October. Oh, they ran yeah. two, year, uh, two years it took to, mm -hmm. to renovate it, but now it's beautiful. Okay, so that takes care of this. Now on this wall here, uh, Edison became so well known in everything he did. Uh, he was an original member of the IEEE, if you're into mm -hmm. computers or... Yeah. He knows that. <laughs> the, the headquarters of that is in Piscataway. Piscataway, that's right. Piscataway. And originally, Edison was one of the charter members. Right. And at that time, it was called the AIEE, -E, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Oh, Electrical Engineers. And then later, it was changed to I for International. And then, more, and more recently, they added and, and computing. computing. Yeah. So, so I, we are a milestone site. That's a very important thing for us. This site. I, I think they're sort of like they set the standards globally. Oh for, yeah. Oh, that's what like the standards. Internet are. wires. USB. Well, every every standard. Oh, oh every, yeah, every standard. standard. Every standard, every standard is yes. still there. Yes. Yeah. Goes through them. Yeah. So this is only two thousand six. Mm -hmm. So Edison, of course, became very famous, and they made coins, and they made stamps, yeah, and they, right. you know, they made stamps. Stamps. I remember, see, but this is that 1947. Was 1947 sure. Older than me. Older than you, really? I'm, no, I'm 1949. I'm older than you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm way older than you. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so he became very, very famous, world famous. But the biggest honor, but if he was long, long gone, they changed the township of Raritan, which is what this was. And they changed it to the township of Edison, Edison. Mm -hmm. in 1950. So this was originally called Raritan. Raritan. Raritan after the Raritan River, which is right over here. Raritan River. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at that time there was a North Raritan, South Raritan, West Raritan, whatever. And so they decided to change the Raritan because it was very confusing, and mail would go to the wrong 1954. place. 1954. 54. Oh, well, we are. We were already around in 54. Sure, right. I was five years older than oh, 54. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, so that's the story on here. Yeah, but you know, like the life of Al, uh, Edison is always a lesson in the elementary school. Oh, sure. When I was in the sure. elementary school, I remember that. Far, there's far more interest in it internationally than there is in American schools. Mm -hmm. Very, very little is, is told about Thomas Edison in American schools. Yeah, but going back to his loss of hearing, yeah. you said they pulled him up. I remember specific somebody. Boxed him in the air. Well, but it could be. Bo boxing doesn't mean that in those days they meant boxing was like this. Oh, yeah. So they went. The, that oh. one would even. Yeah, they did concussion. You, you concussion. Yeah, yeah, right. right. But that's. It's written so many different ways. He told the story so many different ways. We don't even know if that's what caused it. But, you know, that's what his, he did. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is a. This is a bust of Thomas Edison. He was five foot nine and a half inches tall. So you really patterned it after that height. Yeah. This one is that's five exactly. nine, right? Yeah, that's five nine. Five yeah, nine I'm wearing five yeah, six. Yeah, that's five nine and a half. Yeah, you shrunk a little bit since. I'm shrunk a little. Nineteen forty seven. Nineteen forty nine. Forty nine. Forty nine. I'm shrunk. I used to be six two. Mm. <laughs> I think it, it'll start now. More. Like, so you see, like I'm sixty seven now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So this was a this was a book, very interesting part that he was told by his patent attorney to keep this book in his pocket at all times. He says, if you're ever out in the field, he says, don't wait till you come back to the office mm -hmm. to, to write you know write up an an idea. He says, you write your idea in this little book, and you get somebody to sign their name to put a time and date as a witness that they saw you invent this. Mm -hmm. And that'll stand up in court should you need it. See, this is a, they sew the pages in, so you can't take the pages in or out. Mm -hmm. Right. So he says, so that's what you do. He says, okay, so he carried these around and he left thousands of these behind. All Ooh, written, really? yeah, thousands oh. of them, yeah. And so uh, there were three occasions where he was challenged, he was challenged constantly on his patents, but there were three occasions where he was challenged and there was an earlier entry in here than there was in uh, than the person that was challenging. So there was an earlier entry. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, because and, it was the date all yeah, the time. Yeah, that's right. And um, uh, we uh, we always I always tell this story. And um, one time I told the story, and I had this big guy standing right here, 
and I got finished telling about the book, you know, blah, blah, and the man goes like this. He says, 